Alright, what's up crew? This is Pistol Pete here and we're back for another Questions with the Coach here with Mark Baker. So today we have 12 questions for you and so here we go. We're going to jump right into them. All Let's right. do it. Question number one. I'm six foot three and have hypermobility, which makes my backswing creep higher and higher without me feeling it. I have plenty of ball speed and revs to match and know how to adjust either up or down depending on conditions. Ideal backswing is about shoulder height, but when it creeps upward, I tend to pull the arm in front, hit high, and it miss messes with my timing. I've had the local PSO shorten my grip, which eases the strain on my fingers, but what can I do to keep the backswing in check? So the way you want to look at something like that is that the, the, the rhythm of your footwork, so let's say you take five steps, you want to make sure the rhythm of your footwork matches the rhythm of your swing. So if your footwork's like one, two, three, four, slide, say, you know, you know, there's all kinds of great bowlers that do that. Uh, Dave used it back in the day, my day had great rhythm. Tommy Jones, one, two, three, four, slide. Chris Barnes, one, two, three, four, slide. If the rhythm of your footwork and your rhythm of your swing match, that's why I'm such a big proponent of staying tall in the beginning. So if you're very tall and you stay tall and you have a smooth swing going back, the rhythm of your swing and the rhythm of your feet will address the height of your backswing. The reason why your swing gets so high, even though you have hypermobility and you're tall, if you get quick early and you pull it up, your swing just keeps going. So your slide's starting to go forward, but the ball's too up here. So you have late timing. So really work on the rhythm of your feet and match the rhythm of your swing. That'll take care of a lot of those problems. Now this next one, actually less of a question and more of just uh, oops, a comment somebody had that they really wanted me to tell you so this is from fish and bowling on reddit and they said I don't have a question but I've got one of his Mark's son's bowling balls that Barry Asher gave to me when I visited Southern California and I really wanted you to tell him thank you for me so from fish and well, bowling thank you very much for the ball that's very cool when, uh, you know, Gage goes up and weight or we try something new. We tend to give all the balls to Barry because we want them to go to good use. So the fact, fact that I found a great home, I can't be happier. I hope there's a lot of strikes left and Gage didn't take them all. <laughs> so Mark said in his newest video, The Game's Changed, how he's not a fan of teaching the crossover step anymore. The majority of elite bowlers utilize the crossover step. So I'm curious, why does he not now want to teach this? Well, I disagree with you. If you look at E.J. Tackett, no crossover. You look at Anthony Simonson, no crossover. You look at Bill O'Neill, they all cross in front. What I mean is they take a five-step approach. Their second step goes directly in front of their left foot. Because I don't think it's, because I'm a big believer now, your third step should be the crossover step. That's the step that goes a little left. I talk about that quite a bit in my video because that allows your pivot step to go straight and drop inside your head. So that way, when you look, there's no body part in the way of your downswing. I think the second step should be tall. I think it should be directly into your head. And your third step should be more the, the uh, crossover step, allowing your pivot step to just go straight front. So that way there's nothing in the way of your downswing. That's why I do it. I think if your second step catches the weight of your head, it stabilizes your shoulder and that causes a free swing. I think if you have too big of a crossover, their third step either goes dead left or comes around back in front, then they have a hard time for their pivot step to go in the proper place. I do extensively talk about that with Prather, Daniel McEwen, and Dave Houston on my video. And those are my examples that don't have it. Like I said, I can name quite a few of the pros that don't. They kind of cross in front, not completely cross over. I was just watching the shorts and I saw one about breaking down the lanes correctly. This is kind of a multi-part question here. Staying more right in practice before moving left. Mark also talked about that in camp. In a tournament environment where you're moving pairs each game over four to eight games, does this still apply? Should you not care about how you mess up the lanes for the people behind you? Is it better to try to create hold for them? Or what advice do you have in regards to breaking down the lanes when you only have one control for one game and you're moving? So I made a living as a throwing a bowling ball for a lot of years. I didn't really care what I did for the other guy. Last time I looked on the entry fee, it didn't say anything on there about me making lanes better for the other guy. So if you've only got one game, make it as good for you as possible. And obviously when you move pairs, you're gonna do your best with whatever's out there. But I would never worry about my competition too much. You paid an entry fee, 
do your very best to knock down the most pins possible. On the other side of that, if you have no ball reaction, the person on the on that's bowling with you, they're not going to change how they're playing lane, so you have a better ball reaction. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. Do your job, knock down the most pins possible, and then adjust when you get to the next pair. Okay. And then the second part of this question would be, also, what are any key things you would suggest to get locked in on a new pair right away if you haven't had time to see what line people were playing or what equipment they were using? Well, obviously, if you bowled a pretty good game before that, you're going to try it pretty close to that. And that's where a lot of experience comes in and having an idea where your ball is going down lane. You make your two big shots on the first two shots in each lane, and then you have to adjust. I always thought the best part about bowling was going to a pair where the lanes were messed up. One lane hook was tighter, one lane hooked more. Typically, bowlers tend to complain a lot when that happens, all oh, this happened, that happened. Being a, a, a jock, that's just how sports works. So when people would complain, I would go to those pairs and I would try to just figure it out faster. You, you have to expect every pair to be different. You have to er expect every pair to be backwards. So if you have no expectations and you're very open-minded, it makes adjusting much easier. Don't ever have any preconceived ideas. Let your ball be your guide. More importantly, watch the people on your pair. If they're playing lanes like you, that obviously that gives you permission. But always have an open mind and you really, really want to not ever remember how you played in the day before because lanes are never the same. They always change. I have one lane here at the training center. I'm in charge of putting the oil in. I put the cleaner in. I run the machine. They're almost different every day. It's gotten real hot here in Southern California. So now my lanes are playing really, really tight in the back ends for some reason. You would think they'd hook more. They're actually, the oil stay in the lane longer. I do the mix. So lanes change every day. I do one lane and it's different every day. Have an open mind. Let your ball be your guide. So our next question is, does the Baker box work if you're using a plastic ball like a T-Zone? That is an excellent question that I've never thought about. I would think the Baker box would have to move slightly to the left. So five, six, seven, eight would probably have to go. That was more like when I bowled on tour. By my first couple of shows I made on TV were throwing yellow dots. And I would imagine our zone back then was more like eight, nine, 10, 11. For one, T zones don't have much of a core. So the ball's not gonna bounce off five unless the lanes you're bowling on are just unbelievably dry. So as a general rule, if we had to go back to plastic, I would probably have to move the Baker box to the left if you're right-handed, probably two boards. So instead of doing five, six, seven, eight, I think it'd be more like seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So how does one achieve a really free and easy swing like Mike Fagan and Pete Weber? I tend to pull up on my swing to have a higher backswing, which creates inconsistencies. Well, Pete probably has one of the greatest swings in the history of our sport. And Pete has some of the greatest rhythm with his footwork. I talked about that earlier. Pete's footwork allows his swing to be really smooth. Pete stays real tall, he takes six steps in his first three steps, so he's stabilizing that shoulder on the push away. The ball swings up, he walks by it. I think it has all to do with your footwork. You know, the rhythm of Pete would be one, two, three, four, five, slide. If you look at his swing speed and his foot speed, they've always matched up unbelievably. That's probably, the, you know, in the last 45 years, it's either Pete Weber or Parker Bone with the two best swings in balance. So either one, great rhythm, great swing. I think they both stay tall quite a bit through their push away and their, and their downswing. So that it, when you drop down that second step, that's what causes the ball to get pulled up. They don't drop down, they walk by it, their balls swing up, their hips drop at the same time. And they uh, obviously their results are pretty good. So I switched from one-handed to two-handed. As a one-hander, I found it very easy to change my axis rotation depending on the way the lane was playing. As a two-hander, I can come straight up the back of the ball and throw a completely flat straight, or I come all the way around the ball. I can't find any in between with real consistency. Do you have any advice? Yeah, I would. it's always about where you add the rotation. So that's very unusual that you can get around a lot. As a two-hander, that means you're using your shoulder quite a bit. If you look at the videos, I did the two-handed video, the game's changed, both Belmonte and Simonson. Their thumb, when they throw the ball, their hand barely rotates very much at all. So they get that, that, that form going through their target and they add their rotation second. So it very to me, it's very critical where you turn the ball. So to me, for two-handed, it always comes down to timing. And the Belmo logo being the timing spot that I measure, your left arm, when your slide foot gets flat in front of your head, if you get to the timing spot and you have better timing, that'll allow you to turn the ball later 
And when you turn the ball later, you won't have to turn it as much to get that shape you're looking for. How can you help someone who can't get to the foul line? I tried walking back from the foul line with a four step approach, but I'm still end up a foot away from the foul line. See, that doesn't matter. It depends where your ball lands. So again, we go to my, the, the videos I just produced. One of the, the senior was Dave Houston. He finishes a good two or three feet behind the foul line. So it's for Svensson, but they have great trajectory. They don't have massive knee bend. They get the ball on the lane. If you're one foot behind the foul line, but your ball is landing two to three feet on the lane, then it's not an issue. So what you have to do is just make sure where's your ball landing before I'd make a change. Now, if your ball is landing before the foul line on the approach, that's an issue. You're gonna have to decrease your knee bend, add the rotation later and increase your loft. How is cupping the ball supposed to feel, especially on the downswing and at the bottom of the swing? Some people tell me the pressure is on the wrist. Some say it's a pressure from the thumb muscle. And some say there's no pressure from manipulating the ball inertia to get under it. What feeling should I be looking for in terms of understanding what my body is doing to improve my release? That is a very tricky question. I bowled on tour and I cut my wrist a ton. I never felt it anywhere. The ball just rolled up on my wrist and I felt the ball in my palm. I get what you're doing. So the ball is in my palm and I rolled it off my hand. Obviously, if I look at old videos, my wrist, my elbow bent pretty good and I had a cup wrist. Uh, I've never really taught much of that. I, I'm not a big, it's a very tricky thing. It would be the last thing I would work on with somebody after balance and timing and consistency and accuracy. So I've never really, it's more about how, I can't really show it. It's more about how you load your elbow up if your elbow love loads up, then your wrist gets cut for free. If your arm is straight and you cup your wrist, the only person who was really effective at that was Mark Roth and he was one of a kind. So the key to cupping your wrist is on the downswing. When the ball is on its side down, you bend your elbow a little bit, that should roll the ball up in your hand and then just roll it off your hand. I'm not a big believer in trying to feel it cupped because I don't think that makes releases very consistent. I myself, Never at Mike Ball, I cupped my wrist pretty hard. Never thought about it my entire life. It just kind of did it. So I'm not really sure how to teach that. For two-handers, are you supposed to keep the trailing leg low to the ground like most one-handers, or is it okay to kick up high like Packy does? I think kicking it up's better. If you look at Simonson and Belmonte, the two best, both their back legs are off the ground. But the key is, I don't care how high your back leg goes, as long as your back knee isn't higher than your front knee at release. Because if your back knee gets too high, then your head goes down, your shoulder goes forward, and you come around it. So does your back foot stay on the ground? No, your back foot can come off the ground. Both Belmonte and Simonson does it. Obviously, you just mentioned Packy, but their back knee never goes higher than their front knee. That way it allows them to stay stable with their upper body. What is your opinion on knee bend versus no knee bend as a two-hander? I think you need some knee flex. I'm not a big believer in knee bend. Knee bend tends to create a lot of early roll and slow ball speed. So I know I understand Simo gets pretty low to the ground. Remember, Simo also starts low to the ground. He's not overly tall. So a guy like Jason has like the perfect amount of knee bend. Chris Barnes has middle knee bend, EJ Tackett, Bill O'Neill. Uh, knee bend was taught in my generation, the 70s and the 80s, because the balls didn't have big cores. They had three ounce hockey pucks. Now the cores are five pounds. So you want your ball to be controlled down lane where it hooks. If you have excessive knee bend in the beginning, I think it makes your ball roll early and the core read the wrong place. I'm a big believer in knee flex. I'm not a big believer in a lot of knee bend. As a two-hander, I would watch Mr. Belmonte. That's about the perfect amount of knee bend. His ball gets in the lane pretty damn smooth. It's, it's worked out okay for him. All right, and then this is our final question. So it's another two-hand question. I'm a two-hand righty bowler, and I find it really hard to hit my target when throwing straight up the back of the ball, especially for left side spares. Any positions, on, any tips on how to position my body so I stop missing my target so much? So the key is your breastplate. You're having two hands on your swing and you're swinging it off your shoulders. Your breastplate determines where your hands go. So if your breastplate is aiming at your target down lane, your hands will follow. So the key to that is having good timing. Again, you know, my instructional video, the, the game's changed, the two-handed. I spent a lot of time talking about this. 
The key is the timing spot. If you're in time, you're using your right leg as a right-hander, as your power source. If you're timing as early as a two-hander, the only available power source is your shoulder. So you pull the ball down with your shoulder, now your breastplate will be way left of where you're trying to throw it. So you'll miss dead right, or you'll pull it across the front. The key to this is being in time, so your shoulders aren't the power source, so your upper body stays quiet. Then it's a swing, whether it's one-handed or two-handed. But you watch the best bowlers, their breastplate never leaves the object in. That way your hands can just roll right at the target. All right, perfect. Well, that is all our questions. Thank you very much for that. Uh, crew, as always, they, uh, we always appreciate Mark's time. So do us a favor, go back, check out his videos. The game has changed videos. They're fantastic. One hand has a, an addition. There's a two hand addition and they'll definitely teach you a lot of the, specific, the specifics we see come up time and time again in the questions so uh other than that please like subscribe mark you got anything you want to say to everybody hey i really enjoy the questions i really like in these segments please keep sending them in you guys all, all your questions matter because it always applies to you i'm an old guy i'm a coach it's your feel you're the one throwing it so don't think your questions aren't good all these questions are great because they relate to you individually i'm not trying to do a coaching class I'm really trying to be as specific as I can to each individual question because I want everybody to enjoy this game. I've made a living at it for 45 years. Bowling's been great to me. My job is to help as many people as possible. So please, no matter how you think your question is gonna come out, just ask it. I will do my very best to help answer it. And then we'll keep going from there. I do enjoy this segment. I really appreciate you guys uh, liking and all the comments you send in. All right guys, we'll see you in the next video.